So let's start with 7.2 today. None of these are in a particular order. All of them are kind of for like iteration three or something in the future. So it doesn't really matter what order we do them in. So what we're talking about today, um, why we're talking about what we're talking about today, which is this conceptual modeling idea, whatever the hell that means, is a critical element of software design in general. If you're ever like thinking of software, or frankly, if you're thinking about anything in life, any kind of engineering, design, planning, um, you need to be able to translate something that's complex, like a complex system, into ideas that are high level and understandable. Okay, the, the kind of classic example of this might be climate change. Like how complex do you think climate change is? Like you're all pretty smart, you're all pretty, you're probably half of you are, have a science background or something. You know that there's everything like carbon dioxide, deforestation, ocean acidity, like there's a million different things, but they can still explain climate change to you in terms of, um, you know, graphs and charts and animations and everything else. Um, who remembers the, is it the water cycle? Is that the thing where the rain comes down and picks? The water cycle, right? Um, these are all examples of conceptual models. They're a way of con conceiving something that's complex and turning it into something high level and understandable. So we're going to be speaking about conceptual models broadly, and then we're also going to be speaking about state diagrams, which are a particular example of conceptual models, which come up in the course in a bit more detail. So firstly, what is a model? Um, that's a model. Uh, something you might think about, you ask a kid or, I mean, this is a bit dated, I don't think kids these days are like, oh, model ship in a glass bottle, but a bit of like a cliche for maybe our parents' generation. Um, is this the thing where they like assemble it inside the glass thing? Sounds, sounds psycho. Um, who's seen a map, you know, Mot, you know, not to scale? You see a toy plane, you know, see those little planes people fly around that are like the size of this? That's just a model of a plane, you know, a model plane, a model boat, a model car. Um, that's one idea of a model. <coughs> Another model that you might see is this. This looks terrifying and unpleasant, doesn't it? Um, this is a mathematical model. It's okay. Are you okay? Everyone donate a dollar. It's okay. You know what? I used, to, I used to hate at uni when lecturers would single me out when something happened that was embarrassing. So I'm just, get, I'm just getting my dues back for all the pain. We had this one lecturer at uni uh, when I was studying who, if you got up, this is actually a terrible thing to do. If you like got up in the middle of the lecture to like leave, um, he would just stop talking and stare at you until you left. <laughs> like, so you'd be like talking and then like, say Etkin just like, just like complete silence. It was the most horrific thing. Um, math professor, funnily enough. Um, it didn't do math for long after that. So mathematical models, uh, you've seen these ways of, uh, who remembers projectile motion or something in high school when you're doing like little bits of math that are like some object flies through the air. There's no air resistance. There's no accounting for turbulent airflow. It's literally just an object flying through the air. That's a simplified model. Like you're conceptually trying to model something. Um, this is a model. <laughs> These just come from Google. They're, they, they're really not adequately sourced. This is a systems diagram. You'll do more stuff like this in uh, 2511, uh, which you kind of have to do after this course. So I don't think any of you have done it. When you look at domain modeling, um, UML diagrams, <coughs> they're just ways of modeling software. I don't have COVID, by the way. I've just been talking for like three hours, so my throat's a bit coarse. Um, this is again, this is database modeling. So when you do database design and, and like proper database design, not the kind of simple things we get you to do in this course, you can do entity relation modeling, which is ways of um, looking at very big complex pieces of data structures so that if someone wants to understand what your code is doing, they don't have to look at uh, code. You know, they don't have, you don't have to be like, let me send you my .ts files and you can figure out how the data is stored. You can send them a very simplified model of it. And then we have, of course, something we all hope to never see again, the model of the atom from high school. Some of you might see it again. Um, and these are just more models. I don't know why it included so many. So a model is a simplified representation to assist in the understanding of complex ideas. I think most of us should get that by now. Um, and it does cover everything from physical models all the way through to, to these abstract models, like you know mathematics and so forth. Conceptual modeling is kind of where we rule out all those uh, paper planes, boats in a, in a bottle kind of thing, and we focus more on um, modeling systems that are done at a conceptual, abstract, thought level, 
a bit more so than something in a physical way. And these basically are just diagrams and visuals at the end of the day, right? Like even though it's in your head, uh, it's always written down. If you think about the previous examples we have, this is a conceptual model, 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 that is not. This is a conceptual model. Um, that is fairly intuitive. So we talked to a few of these. These top three examples were on the previous slide, but the bottom one here, state transition diagrams uh, or state machine models, they're actually what we're going to talk about in more detail. And they're how you track a system that transitions between different states. So, generally speaking, conceptual models are, um, there's two types that you can look at. One is a structural conceptual model and the other is a behavioral conceptual model. Again, fairly intuitive what these mean. A structural conceptual model just describes how something is structured. You know, think about a, a house plan. You know, who's, who's ever looked at a rental or a house and you've seen like a house plan, right? Bedroom, bathroom, front door. That's a structural conceptual model. Um, diagrammatic, visual, I mean that, you know, maybe not super conceptual because it's a bit more literal. There's no like hard definitions of these words. Um, <coughs> but the two examples we've seen so far, which is a class diagram that you'll see in 2511, that's describing components of a software. It's essentially a file map and all the relationships between files. And then the ER diagrams for database design, that's essentially tables or objects in a database and how they're all related to each other. You know, you have users and channels and messages like this. Then you have behavioral diagrams, which aren't about how something's structured, but they're actually about how someone interacts with it. You know, so the example we're going to look at today are state diagrams and examples we're going to look at next week are use case diagrams. So for instance, if you're actually trying to mock up for someone, like a, think of like a recipe. You know, a recipe has a behavioral model, like not a model, but it has a behavioral element, right? Which are the steps. It kind of describes the behavior something goes through. Um, you would say that a, the water cycle, our favorite thing in the world, that's like a behavioral model. It's showing how something behaves and interacts with the environment. It's not showing the static structure of it. Basically, if it, if it describes a, like a living dynamic system, it tends to be behavioral and not um, structural. So, what are models used for? Fairly intuitive. They're used to predict the future. Climate change, right? Climate change models, we're all going to be underwater and all that stuff. Um, understand the current state of affairs. This can happen a lot with... Um, who watches the evening doomsday financial news? Anyone do that? Where like old white people get up and they're like, <laughs> you know, today and, you know, Coca-Cola went down 6% and like everyone's going to lose their house next month and <laughs> stuff like that. Um, you know, models can help us understand the current state of affairs because if we take all these things we know, we take all, you know, people's houses and how much debt they have and what their wages are and um, what the cost of fuel is and we kind of fumble it all together, think about like punching that all into like a piece of JavaScript code to learn something, you can essentially model how sad people are or something, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> um, determine the past state of affairs. So we can kind of model the past, you know, like just extrapolate into the past. And then um, just to simplify, frankly, sometimes it just is a way to reduce complex topics down. So um, this is a bit of a, sometimes uh, my slides generally very light and airy in detail. So occasionally we include some references to some more thorough definitions and stuff. So that just kind of says stuff we've been talking about in a bit more of a serious way, if you wanted to leave that with you. Um, but let's get on to a specific type of conceptual model which we focus in on because the point of this lecture is for you to understand modeling as a concept to understand that okay there's this idea out there where when someone says to me I'm gonna go model that you're like I know what that means now I understand that you're saying we're gonna go and take this complex thing and reduce it down a good example would be you know um, at work uh, we currently we charge people money to buy US stocks, you know? So you can buy a Tesla stock or a Tesla share or you can buy an Amazon share and we charge you money to do it. We charge you $6.50 to do it. It doesn't cost us $6.50, it costs us something else that I'm not gonna tell you, right? But it's less than $6.50. Um, and, you know, I was talking to one of my colleagues and we said, you know, well, let's have a look at 
uh, what if we want to change the pricing? So instead of it costing $6.50 always, uh, why don't we make it cost a percentage? So 1% fee, you know? So if you, you buy $100 of Amazon, instead of it costing you $6.50, it costs a dollar, 1% of 100. And if you buy $1,000 of Amazon, instead of it costing you $6.50, it costs $10. Okay, so different things for the consumer. But, you know, we don't just sit around and be like, let's just guess. We say, let's go and model this. Let's actually go and, in this case, in Excel, is like a common place that you might try and model something. So we go into Microsoft Excel and we punch in some numbers and we think about, you know, what's the worst case, what's the best case, like uh, boundaries and everything else. And we just try and simplify it down to like, you know, this will on average probably change our revenue from this to this. And in the best case, we'll actually get more revenue. And in the worst case, we'll get that, you know, just bringing it down to something digestible. In a lot of ways, you can kind of see the purpose of modeling as, um, and I think we mentioned this earlier, but there's, there's two simple purposes I see of modeling in general. First one is, if you model something, it will help you understand it without getting lost in the weeds. Have you ever written a piece, I'm sure all of you have by this point, you write a piece of code, you kind of get completely lost as to what the hell it's doing, or like what it's for, or like why you're, like you're just like trying to solve this problem, and you're just like, I don't even know why I'm here anymore. I'm completely lost. Um, sometimes it helps you keep the bigger picture. You know, it's like a reminder, a bit of a, a landmark. And then on the other side, there are people who will never understand what you're doing as well as you, all the time, right? No one's ever gonna understand, you know, the subtleties of everything that exists in your house and why it should be there. Why, like, why should this jar be in that thing? I mean, who keeps, um, who keeps like, you know, barbecue sauce and tomato sauce? Yeah, you ever had that? Yeah, great. <laughs> who, who keeps it in the fridge? Okay, who keeps it out of the fridge? Yeah, see? No one can figure it out. I mean, it says on the bottle, but let's not get to that. So, um, but you know, you, you couldn't explain all the subtleties of how you, you ever go to your friend's houses and they like keep tomatoes in the fridge or something? Or something random and you're just like, I don't get it. Anyway, this is a terrible example, but the point is that there are, you will never understand other people or other people's work sometimes. So when they can model it for you like this, it's like, it's really just that communication tool. So state diagrams is a particular type of model. The reason that state diagrams are chosen for 1531 is because you don't really deal with state in 1511. Um, you do, I guess, a little bit with 152. Who's done 1521? Yeah, yeah, yeah. None of you, you care. You got two years of not having to put your hand up from your bedroom, eh? You're all, you're all a bit lazy. 2141. Is that an elect one? Oh, you're a smarty pants. Elect scares me. I wanted to do an elect degree, and then I tried, and then uh, I just said I'm too stupid, and that's what. It's your last elect course, and you made it through. Yay! That's good. Uh, you can't, you can't fail now, and you've gotten the congrats. That's good. Um, is it this term? No more, no pure elect courses left. That's good. I'm happy for you. Does anyone else do? Who does a double degree here? Okay, keep your hand up if it's with engineering. Okay, seems like everyone. Who does uh, a lec or mech? Either. Oh, what, what's my. Oh. Oh, mechatronics. Mechatronics? Okay. The best. The best? Yeah, the best. Who does a double with civil? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, mechanical, electrical, few people, renewable, or photovoltaic. I don't know what else is there these days. Is mining still a thing? Mining engineering at UNSW has been the weirdest thing. It's gone through like these aggressive intakes and outtakes. They, uh, I think when I started uni, they took like a couple hundred students or something. And then when I was halfway through uni, they took like six new students. <laughs> Literally, the number of students doing mining engineering just went up and down with the mining booms. But the tragedy of it all was that um, if there was a mining boom, people would go study, and it takes like four years for the mining boom to end. <laughs> so they'd all graduate with like less jobs, and then when there was like no mining boom and they needed to train people up, no one would do it. So then there would be a mining boom and there'd be like no one to graduate into. So anyway, glad you're all doing some fun stuff. So. Um, in 1531, we deal with state a lot more, right? And, and if you don't know what I mean by that, think about this. It's like you run a express server, 
and it just runs forever, right? Like you go back to 1511, you just like click run, it finishes. There's no like, I don't know what they teach these days. I, I don't know what it, it, maybe the assessments have changed, but like generally there's not a lot of like wild true loops in 1511, right? Um, so in this course, Express is a basically a wild true loop that's just constantly listening for people to talk to it. Um, and therefore your application kind of starts here and then when someone registers, its state changes a bit. Like what it is changes. And if you think about a state change, think about, is that a, think about that as a change to your data store, essentially. So if you change your data store, you change what's on the file, that's basically a state change. So it's very relevant to the project. Um, and we're gonna be looking at state diagrams <coughs> where state diagrams are really as simple as they look. Uh, here is a simple example of a state machine, a state diagram that describes a door. Profound, isn't it? You know, the door can open, the door can close. Um, the circles describe the states themselves and the lines describe the transitions between those states. So, you know, Door is closed, door can be opened. Once it is opened, it is now in the open state. Once it is closed, it is now in the closed state. Relatively straightforward. Um, and you might see some variations in notations, right? Like some people might use squares instead of circles. Some people might use lines with bigger arrows. Like who knows, but it's all generally the same thing. State machines, which I've referred to, are essentially um, what state diagrams are used to, you know, demonstrate. So you could, describe your, you could describe most things as state machines. You could describe yourself as a state machine, right? You're essentially moving between a series of states. You'll see this happen a lot in um, programming in general. And the first time I think I was exposed to a state machine in any meaningful way was probably in um, uh, when I was part of, yeah, I don't have it here. I'm on, I'm on my work Mac, which doesn't have paint. Very sad. So there is JavaScript paint.app. <laughs> it's even worse. Um, it's so bad. It is the right version of paint. So uh, when I was in Robocop, um, you've seen the ro you've seen the robots that kick soccer balls? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The Ob Obo Cup. Um, these little these little things, yeah, they run around the field and they kick balls and stuff. Yeah, super fun. I went to two competitions with it. Um, these robots are very straightforward. They have a part of them that's responsible for all their like kinematics, mechanics that helps them walk and stuff. Very low level, like how do I move a joint? Things that you take for granted that you're really smart. Um, they have vision parts which look at <coughs> look at the world with, through cameras and interpret it into objects. They have a localization engine that helps take what they know about objects and where their legs are from the moving and they figure out where they are. You know, like you know where you are because you see things and you know how far you've walked, right? You walk forward, you, like, you get that. And then I was working on a lot of the behavior stuff which is essentially deciding what to do, you know? And it really wasn't some fancy, you know, artificial intelligence thing. It was a lot of like if statements and, you know, while loops and various other things, but we modeled the behavior of the robot with essentially as a state machine where what we would do, heaven forbid if this works, is we would, you describe a state like this, which would be say the, the run, that's, that's visible enough I guess, um, which would be like the run. So it'd be like, should you be running right now? Um, and you know what, you'd be running if you saw the ball, right? So if the robot sees the ball over there, it needs to run for the ball if it's the closest robot. And what happens is, is that whilst it's running, it might not, it might lose the ball, right? Because it's a dumb robot. And the robot might just suddenly turn around and be like, I can't see the ball anymore. So if it loses the ball, what's it gonna do? It's going to, that is a fat line. Um, it's going to search for the ball, right? And as it's searching for the ball, if it finds the ball or if it's like, so, you know, if it finds the ball, it might run for the ball again. <laughs> um, find the ball. And then also, what happens is, if it uh, is next to the ball, then it might try and kick the ball. Right? And what we did, so, you know, if it's, if it's running towards it and then it finally gets next to it, 
uh, it kicks the ball. Now, I, I probably should, I wish I had my thesis on this computer because I could just show you a simple diagram instead of this butchered one, but this is basically a state machine where you're describing like, you know, a robot is a series of behaviors. It's a series of I'm running, I'm looking, I'm walking up to it. We had more than that though. It wasn't just like running towards it. In fact, the robots didn't run, they just walked. But it was like, I walk up to it, I line up for a kick, and then I kick, and then I look for it again. And if I look for it again and I immediately see it, I walk to it again. But then we had even more complicated states because it was like, when you got five robots on the field, they don't all just charge. For, who's played soccer before, right? If you're down the back and the ball's up the front, you don't see, I can see it, and you start running up towards it, right? You, you wait to see what your other team members do. So it was like, it was a mix of like, uh, in like a wait state. So there was one that was like um, too far away. And if you were too far, I think it was called track from memory. I, I, this was so many years ago. It's like track. So if you're in a certain place, if you were so far away from the ball and your team, team members were closer, you would just watch the ball. So you had it in constant vision, right? Um, and this again was all modeled into kind of state machines. So these things are really, really useful. And, and there's, so, there's so much software that you can sincerely model this way. But back to this. State diagrams are just descriptions of state machines. Um, state machines are made up of a finite number of states, boxes or whatever. Uh, I think we've covered that to death. Um, and now we have a slightly more involved example, which is a parking meter. So this might help bring it to life a little bit. So with this parking meter example, you can see that you can enter the parking bay. Who pays for parking? Anyone ever pay for parking? I'd rather die, yeah. <laughs> personally. Yeah. You, none of you, who owns a car? That's good. That's good. I don't own a car. Still hope for me. You guys make me feel very welcome. Um, so let's say you take your fancy car to your fancy parking bay <laughs> where they're asking for your big rich person dollars. <laughs> and um, you're in that kind of state on the left and you really just have one transition you can do from that state to another state, right? which is that you can enter a number. It depends on your park, you know, some of them are smarter than this. But this is one of those ones where you have to enter the parking spot you're in. You know, like I'm in spot 16. So you enter that, and now suddenly the machine, think about the state as like a UI. You know, if you ever built an interface, you understand a state machine already, because most interfaces are just state machines. They're just a series of screens that you can move between. You know, like this, this slide deck is literally a state machine between slides. So, you know, you enter the number, and then it asks for how long you want to park there for, and you enter the duration you want to park there for two hours. Um, or you can cancel and go back to the start, you know, go back to the previous screen. Or if you do enter the duration, it now asks you to insert coins. And from there again, you can either cancel uh, or you can insert the coins. And when every time you insert the coin, let's say it wants, you know, $2.70. If you insert a $2 coin, it's going to say, keep it coming. You know, I need more money. And then you put in the, you know, the 50 and the 20 or something like that. And then... Um, if you do have sufficient funds, you will get to the confirm at the end, and if you cancel, of course, at that point, it will eject all the coins. So this is really interesting because you've actually described like an entire piece of software without needing to code anything or draw anything up. It's a really simple model. Uh, and there's, there's a lot of power and value, and if you are presented with problems, just trying to draw out something like that, if it is a system that moves between states. Now, one obvious problem with state machines, and in fact with all modeling, is that it never feels like a slam dunk in terms of it never feels like you can just completely articulate yourself perfectly. A really good example is with the simplified one. Um, <coughs> look at the cancel coins ejected at the top and the bottom. You know, that's a little bit weird, right? Because if you look at all the other transition text, like the number input and the cancel, um, they're all actions people do, you know? Whereas like coins ejected is not really an action. Like you don't coins eject the system. The system coin the coins ejects to you. So that's kind of incongruous with what else is written there. Uh, and that can make it a little bit confusing to read because if you're reading this literally, you think, okay, these are all actions someone takes, but these aren't actually, coins ejected is not an action, it's a result. It's actually what, it's like, you could actually think of it like a state, couldn't you, right? So it's like, you, you, you're waiting to insert the coins, you click cancel, the cancel is the transition, which moves you to the state of ejecting coins, which you could draw a transition to itself that's like still more coins to eject. 
which then when it's done, transitions to enter parking bay, right? Now that might be like a slightly more accurate way of doing it, but nothing is perfect either. Um, and the point I'm trying to convey here is that there is no uh, perfect model. Everything's a little bit clunky. Everything kind of has its limitations. And yeah, you could make that change and maybe that would make you feel better. But then someone might say, well, what happens if you click a button, but it's loading and it takes a few seconds? Are you going to put in another state that's like waiting, pending? Are you going to put like a pending state in between each of these circles? You know, maybe. Like how far do you want to go? At some point, you're going to have to say this is enough. You know, it's conveyed what I'm trying to convey and I'm going to stop. Uh, so if we look at a slightly different one, um, then if someone, yeah, here's an example. Someone says, yeah, yeah, I like your diagram, but it isn't accounting for the fact that if you, if you start using one of these parking meters and you simply stop and walk away, it's not just going to sit there forever. It has a timeout, like most systems where it goes, well, I'm just going to stop and I'm going to restart myself. How do you represent that again? That's kind of hard because that's not like a user action, is it? So in this case, you can just annotate it. Be like, yep, cancel, or if five minutes elapses, coins eject on this transition back to the start. And this is fine. You know, it doesn't need to be perfect, but it still conveys the point, which is really what matters. Um, quick activity. Can we model the Opal card system as a state machine? Who uses public transport? Who's one of those people who like would rather die than hop on a bus? <laughs> One, okay. Have you ever caught a bus? I have. Is that why you don't want to? Yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. That explains it. Um, I caught so many buses from UNSW to the city for most of my life that I genuinely would rather walk at this point. So I can empathize with that. Um, I'm not going to use uh, jspaint.app as great as it is. I'm going to... Um, What's a free drawing tool? Do I have to log in? Oh, sorry, yes. Sorry? Um, I, I look, I was very privileged in that uh, I either lived near campus or I lived in like mascot Rosebury, so I never had to be one of those poor people. <laughs> like, like que queuing up in the morning. Um, I like it because it's, it's much comfier. You know, I have a lot of traumatic memories of like sitting on a bus and then being really tired and the bus going around a corner and me like launching into the, the aisle of the bus like asleep. Um, so who likes the light rail? Who hates the light rail? Would you rather buses? Is that the thing? Quicker? Yeah? Okay. What's the difference between a tram and a light rail? Trams are what? Trams were built first. Okay. What's what's a free web drawing tool? <laughs> TS Paint. Okay. Let's 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 go with this and see. Let's see how long it takes us for me to put a, yeah, for me to punish myself. Okay, so, um, Opal Card, you've got public transport, right? What's a state? Come on, tell me some states. Think about think about your extent. New South Wales. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so when we think about states. What, what I may be, maybe an easier thing to think about is think about the state of your Opal card. When I say Opal card, obviously it could be your credit card, right? But like, I'll give you the first state, which is, um, here you go, I'll, no journey. What your credit card's probably in a state of right now with the network. Okay, so I've done my part. What's another state and what's the transition you have to get there? Tap on, okay, so let's call the state. Oh, we're gonna regret using this so quickly. Um, you got start journey, and that came from a tap on. 
Uh, that's the exact sound I think it makes. Um, you got you got to tap on. Okay, then what happens when you know you started your journey? Now what? I don't know if that changes the state of your opal card. Um, what else happens? Yeah. Transfer. How would you represent? That's it, right? I, I, I could recite the whole Opal Bible off the top of my head. So, you know, if you uh, tap off and then you tap on somewhere else, within, tap on the same mode within an hour, you're on a transfer journey, right? So it just extends your trip. How would you represent that with the state diagram? It's extremely hard, this is why I'm asking you to do it, because I couldn't be bothered, right? <laughs> um, yep? So we have like a state, after you tap off, right? That, um, well, basically like, you can say, well, I have a state of this tap off, and then the um, wait, so like, power right? That state, um, so, and it's in an hour time, so then you just tap on again, it goes back to the Yeah. Yeah, so if you're on, say, a train, or a, you know, misery, light rail or whatever you guys feel. Um, you're on it and you tap off. You go into this state where you've tapped off the train, but you're within your first hour of tapping off. And then from here, if you um, tap on again, tap onto the same mode of transport, your journey kind of continues. I probably shouldn't have called this start journey, right? You should probably call it active journey. And maybe, maybe I'll, I don't know how to, I don't want to active journey. How do you rub things out and paint again? I'm pretty sure you have to. I'm mainly just here to relive my childhood at the moment. <laughs> so if you tap off within the first hour, sorry, if you tap back on to the same mode of transport, so here I'm going to say tap back on same mode of transport. So you tap back on another train within the first hour, it extends your trip. Okay, and you can kind of keep doing that until who knows the rule? How long's your journey until they just kick you off? You don't, you don't just keep going. Depends on your mode of transport, right? So, like, if you're on trains, it's five hours. Okay? Just a fun tip. So, if you're on a train and you tap on after five hours, they'll just actually, like, charge you the full rate and be like, you're done, and you don't have a valid trip anymore. Right? So, after five hours... Whoop. So, after five hours, you go back to no journey. So you could say here, like, you know, if journey length exceeds five hours, like this, right? Something like that. Um, cool. And you can kind of lay this on. So, like, what else do you know? Yes? I think, I don't know the exact time period, but if you tap on again after, I don't know, you've got, let's say, 100 minutes. 15 minutes. Tap off 15 minutes. Yep. You tap it again. It reverses. There we go. So if you tap within 15 minutes, it goes back to no journey. Exactly. That's it. So you can tap on reverse after, within 15 minutes. I've done this before. I had to drop, I was at Central and I had to drop something off to a friend at Town Hall. So I tapped on at Central, I caught a train to Town Hall, I ran up, I gave it to them over the gate, I caught a train back to Central, I had tapped off and they didn't charge me a thing. <laughs> and I felt so good about it, you wouldn't even believe. So that, um, so how do we represent that? Well, okay, you think, well, this is pretty easy. I'll just put another line here that says active journey to no journey, and I'll put like a, you know, um, uh, tap off within first 15 minutes. <laughs> what a horrible tool. Um, <laughs> so a couple, a couple things you notice here already if you're trying to actually think about the problem. One of them is that we've created a little bit of confusion here because tap off within first... Fifth, <laughs> Tap off within the first 15 minutes is quite specific, but tap off here is kind of not very <laughs> specific, right? So like I would need to go and modify that text to instead of say tap off, it would be like tap off after the first 15 minutes. Now where things get a little bit confusing is if you follow the kind of flow through this as well, let's say you are not currently on a journey and then you tap on to an active journey and then you tap off after 15 minutes, 
and then you tap back on the same mode of transport, right? Let's say you know you, you come in, you change trains, kind of thing. Um, it then says tap off with the first 15 minutes. This diagram kind of implies that if I catch a train from, you know, uh, Central to Chatswood, and then I get off for 20 minutes, and then I come back and tap on from Chatswood to Hornsby, that I can just tap off on my second journey within 15 minutes and get the refund, you know? Get, like, you know, whatever, because it, it, we haven't quite distinguished between your first 15 minutes of any trip and I'm not, I'm not going to solve this, I couldn't be bothered. But it's like, um, this is the kind of challenge you have to think about when you're doing stuff like this, because it's all communication. It's all about how is someone who has no idea, what, how are they not going to get tripped up? Because just because you understand how it works, um, and maybe we're overthinking it, maybe, you know, there is no right level of detail as well. How do you do insufficient balance and everything else? But you can kind of take this further and further. Um, I think... That's all I wanted to add to that. Does anyone have anything they would like burning to add to our Opal state machine? Insufficient funds. Insufficient funds. How would you add that? Oh, oh, like uh. Sure, like this, you mean? Whee! Yeah. Um, and this would be like insufficient funds. Yeah, okay. See, again, it's really interesting because it's a question like, what are you modeling? Um, like, this doesn't represent what those Opal card readers at train stations or buses should say, right? Because it doesn't model the fact that, like, it's blank, but then when you tap, it says insufficient funds, and then, like, you can't tap again. Have you ever tried to, like, tap on and then tap off five seconds later. Have you ever tried to do that? It won't let you, right? Because it's like, I just got to double check this person isn't being a moron and tapping on twice. Um, so there's like more and more nuance to it. And this is a, the point of this exercise is not to finish this. The point of this exercise is to make you think about, to like bring you along the journey of how you might have to think to model something like this. Uh, you can model anything. Okay. We're nearly at the end. One slide to go. Uh, then we'll take a break. We might even just finish early, because um, again, if we got three hours of lecture this week, we might as well do the later evening from the comfort of your bedroom, you know, then like, you, you get my point. Um, so, last one, which is just a bit more of a practical thing um, to talk about. Uh, one of the more other fun conceptual models that I was part of was stuff with the solar car team. Um, if you have seen this around, I th is this car still in Tyree? Did they leave it in Tyree? Has anyone looked in Tyree? Yeah. So this, this car is still in Tyree. We took this car around Australia. And um, the interesting thing about this trip you do with the solar car, this is my last big example about where like, you can use software to model. Because like, those diagrams and stuff are cool, and diagrams are fun. But I think another fun type of software is a model you solve with code. You know, particularly something where you're trying to, this comes back to the climate change thing. You know, when someone's trying to figure out how much the ocean temperature is going to rise, they write some code that simplifies the world, crunches some numbers and gives an output. So this particular race that uh, we did, uh, happens semi-regularly, is that you take a car that you build, and you drive it from Darwin to Adelaide, across the country, um, 3,000 kilometers. And here's the map, like that. So you drive it like that. You do it over six days, six to seven days. <coughs> and the rules change all the time, but I'll just give you like one example of the set of rules. One of the set of rules were that you have a car. It has to be as light as you want to make it. Um, you can choose the battery pack size, but let's just say there's like 40 kilos of a battery. Not that that probably means anything to most of you. And um, you need to drive from Darwin to Adelaide. And if you drive too fast, you run out of energy and you lose. And if you drive too slow, you get there last and you lose, right? So how can you get there first? How can you get somewhere first without running out of energy? This is not a new idea. This is like literally just a marathon, right? Like I don't run. Who could be bought? Who runs 40? Is anyone here run like that 42Ks marathon thing? Monster. Absolute monster. 
Has anyone ever run like three Ks and been like, I need to go to the hospital and then just thought about someone running like 40 kilometers and you're like, I don't understand. Um, do you run a lot, Etkin, without the buses? How do you get around without running all the buses? You just walk. <laughs> all the time in the world. It's good. Um, so you have this race and you kind of have to ask yourself this question, which is, uh, what is the most efficient way to get from Darwin to Adelaide in six days? You know, I think I described it once as it's about 3,000 kilometers in about a million seconds. You know, how fast should you go to get there? And it's a complicated answer. If it was a straight line, you could just do some pretty, I'm sure, trivial maths, right? You just figure out what the, the energy consumption is at a given speed. You figure out how much energy you have, and you just divide that, right? Like speed equals distance over time kind of thing. Um, did you have your hand up, Pinky? Oh, what was your joke? Uh, you take a plane. Take a plane. <laughs> That's good. That is the fastest way from Darwin to Adelaide. Um, we could take the car in the plane. That would be even better. There are, actually, there are actually very rich teams that fly their car um, to Australia. Most of the teams put it in a boat because um, they can't afford planes. But. Uh, so, but here's the interesting thing. To, to, drive a, to drive a car from Darwin to Adelaide, you've got to account for a lot of stuff and a lot of very dynamic things. For example, it's not perfectly flat, right? Australia's pretty flat, but did you know that Alice Springs is a kilometer higher above sea level than Darwin? Right, so you think about Alice Springs in the middle of the desert. In your head, you just picture like a totally flat Australia, right? Like Uluru's in the middle. <laughs> but it's like Uluru's actually like a kilometer in the air compared to like Darwin. So if you drive from Darwin to Alice Springs, you're actually driving up like a thousand meters in elevation. Then you're driving back down a thousand meters down to Adelaide. You've got different wind speeds on different days. When the wind blows towards you, you need to drive slower. When it blows behind you, you need to drive faster because just like planes, most planes want to fly at a pretty stable speed. They want to fly at like about, I don't know, it's like 900 kilometers an hour to the wind. So if the wind's blowing at them 100 kilometers an hour, they will fly at 900 kilometers, they'll, something, I've lost that train of thought. But it's like, they want to fly constant with respect to the wind. So like some planes will actually be flying like faster than the speed of sound with relative to the ground, but that's because they've got like a massive wind behind them. But so relative to the wind, they're not actually going faster than the speed of sound. So you've got all these kinds of things to consider. You've got cloud cover. It is a solar car, so the more cloud cover you have, the more energy you're getting. So the faster you can go that day, the less cloud cover you have, the difference. All the road is not just perfectly like north-south. It kind of wiggles around a lot. You ever seen roads? Yeah? <laughs> like they don't, they don't always go straight. And therefore, depending on like, you think about a, a car, they're not like most solar panels on a car aren't perfectly flat. So literally the orientation of the car on the road will change how much energy you're getting from the sun. Um, all that kind of stuff. What else did I write down? It's a bunch of other things. But the point is that when, when you're pressed with a really difficult question, which is like, all right, take into account the wind speed, the wind direction, the elevation, the orientation to the road, the cloud coverage, the, the amount of light the sun is giving off today for some reason, how fast should you go right now for the next five minutes? It's like quite a profound question, isn't it? You know? And the only way to solve this, um, and I was lucky enough to help with this, but most of the work was done by a far, far smarter UNSW student um, who wrote an entire piece of software with code which was quite literally, it was written in Python, but Python and JavaScript are basically the same thing. Don't you dare say that. <laughs> <laughs> take that back right now. You don't talk about my baby Python like that. Ah, yes, the Python, Python crews are coming out. So um, they, they wrote it in Python, and it was basically like what you know. You write some code. It was a command line thing, so it took in like some argvs. Uh, you just punched in some numbers and it did some modeling for you and it spat out a speed. And to actually write that piece of code that would take in like, you, what you did was you essentially said to it, um, you, you essentially, you gave it like all the data about the landscape. So it kind of knew at any given time what hill you're on, where you are, what orientation you're on. You gave it weather data, you know, so it like, could uh, take into account all the wind and the solar stuff. And then all you did was it was a program where you essentially called a function and that function took in a single number, which was the number of kilometers you, you were from Darwin 
like I'm 802.5 kilometers from Darwin, and it would tell you how fast you should go for the next five minutes. You know? And that is essentially a conceptual model of the natural world in a piece of code. You know? um, so models are, again, they're all just simplifications of things. And it was, take, it was not taking into account a bunch of stuff. You know, when there's more dust in the air or more humidity, like humidity affects the amount of solar radiation that you get hitting solar cells. Humidity affects probably the efficiency of the electric drivetrain. It probably does something with the friction on the tires. The road surface changes too. You know, you've been on the highway, like nice and smooth, really quiet. You're on that crappy road near where you live with that pothole the council hasn't fixed, right? And it's like bumpy and like super inefficient. The tire pressure of uh, tires, yeah, tire pressure affects <laughs> things. Um, I, I can't remember, but it's like, you know, if you do have a car or anything or even a bicycle, like pump your tires up regularly. Like you lose so much um, energy just like expending on that. So, but the point is the model didn't take into account tire pressure, didn't take into account relative humidity because it's a simplification. We knew all that stuff would maybe be like 1%. So we just like cut it out because you can't truly capture the physical world, right? You get the weather predictions are wrong. Weathers are just models. You know, if, uh, I hope some of you go work in meteorology because I think it sounds fun, you know, predicting weather and stuff. There's probably a lot of cool AI things that happen in there, but um, it's all the same thing, literally all the exact same thing. Do you have any questions about that? Oh, it's really nice being able to ask that and not have to wait for the YouTube lag. By the way, I just realized that we've got this entire, like, YouTube video and I haven't been... Has anyone got it up? Has anyone asked any questions? Oh, sweet God. Oh, no. Oh, shit. <laughs> oh, no. Someone was saying Joe Hayden. Oh, no. Um, Joe Hayden was talking about the economy. How is the turnout? Oh, I mean, I can... It's like... It's pretty... D <laughs> I don't know. It's like 30, 40 people, something. Um... <laughs> What do we got? We got, um, oh, this is so trippy. <laughs> Tap off a destination. I'm so sorry, Jeremy. That was a bow ring atomic model. Is that a joke? Boring? Okay. Saw the maths and collapsed. Hello. <laughs> wish I was there. I wish you were there too, Clayton. Okay, um, where were we? We were here. Is this light? Is there lights for... There we go. I'm so poorly lit. Oh, that's horrible. I should have done that earlier. Yes, any questions about the solar car stuff? Any questions in general? I haven't really paused and asked for your opinions yet. Hungry? Yeah? That's a good question. So the question was, is the, was the driver of the solar car responsible for maintaining the speed they were given? So um, they, from the driver's seat, they could control, they could set a cruise speed very similar to a car. So they would like tap cruise on and they could move it up and down by some. Um, the, the guy who wrote the model, he actually he was literally just a brainiac. And... Um, you communicate with the car by sending packets, right? So it's just like Python JavaScript code that's just sending like data over a network, like you do with the Express server, except it's just different network stuff. Um, because you're reading from the network, he also, he wrote a script once that would like remotely set the speed. So he, we would be sitting in the back of the car and he would be like, oh, just like run like, I'm just using JavaScript talk, you just like run node adjust speed.js space like, 78 and hit enter and then it would like send the command to the car and the car would pick it up and it would set the cruise speed um, He tried that out a couple of times when I was sitting next to him and then he then he literally deleted the file and was like This is too dangerous to be kept alive um, <laughs> Not that it was a complicated file, but um, he was like this is a slippery slope into madness Because um, otherwise you could set speeds like uh, You know you just set the speed of like 120 or something and, and kill someone um, but you could do all kinds of crazy fun things with the software, just unrelated. Like, I think uh, at one point I was driving the car and they thought it would be really funny to reprogram um, 
history program like every button to be the horn. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there was, a, I don't remember, we, we were driving somewhere in South Australia, I think, and yeah, it was like, it was like the left indicator, the right indicator, <laughs> um, the hazard lights, everything was like, you pressed it and it was like the car was just like, beep. Um, or they just turn the horn on remotely sometimes as well. <laughs> Oh, good. Um, can you add a battery to the car? Yeah, you do have a battery to the car because um, here, here's the thing about sol solar cars are really dumb, really. Like, no, like think about this. So, the sun can output about a kilowatt of energy per square meter. Okay, that's a physical limitation of the world. It's not like you can just like science your way to getting more than that. That's like literally just how much sun hits a square meter. So a kilowatt for context is about like your toaster, kettle, a vacuum. Most of those use about two kilowatts of power. So if you've got two square meters of 100% efficient solar cells, you could power a toaster kind of thing. Um, solar cells are not 100% efficient. They're somewhere between 25 and 30%. They probably creep up at like 1% a year. But like, you know, them only being able to improve by like a factor of three is not that exciting. Um, a lot of electric cars like Teslas, when you hit your foot to the floor in a Tesla at full acceleration, you use about 500 kilowatts of power. So if you think about a typical solar cell now, in fact, let's think about a typical perfect solar cell, a 100% efficient solar cell that will never exist. Um, you would need 500 square meters of that to power that Tesla in that moment, right? So solar cells are really bad at capturing energy. Um, which is why they're really terrible on cars, because cars have like no surface area, and like why would you do that? You know, um, you might as well put them on your roofs and charge it up at night. There's probably a good use case to say that like uh, solar cells might help boost up your car by like 10% or something throughout the day, but the majority of people are not driving that much that so they're like, thank God I paid that extra like twenty thousand dollars for those solar cells on the roof that are very fragile because I would have run out of electricity on my drive home from Newcastle today, you know, because I couldn't stop because I was in a rush. So it's just a very niche thing. Um, actually, fun fact, while I'm talking about nonsense, um, who's ever heard of the solar roadways campaign? Yeah, oh, I don't know. So, is that the one? Oh, everything's, everything's German. <laughs> so there was this company and look, just, just, just to preface, when I say solar cars are stupid, I mean for mass production. They're kind of cool, right? Formula One's cool, um, but you know, you wouldn't see Formula One cars out on the road. Doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. Just to be clear, um, but there was this, there was this campaign. I've always found this one really interesting. It was the Solar Roadways campaign. It was, it was like you know those things on YouTube where they're like we're gonna build buses that go above the traffic. And they show you those like little animations and stuff. Um, yeah, like, and, and, and all, like all your silly friends, they like might link it to you and be like, this is so cool. And you as like your budding engineer self is like, it's stupid. Um, but there's this thing called solar roadways where they're like, let's replace the road with solar panels, right? And then we'll have like roads that generate power. And I always thought this was the most interesting, I, I always come back to this when I explain things to people because it is a great example of how the question you ask affects the intelligence of the answer you'll get, right? And what I mean by that is that if I ask you a very simple question, should solar panels be on the road or on rooftops? Right? It's like the easiest thing to answer, isn't it? Like, should they be on a road where like one ton vehicles are driving over? Um, or should they be on all the rooftops that just don't have solar panels on them? Right? But the question that was asked when you see a lot of how this kind of campaign was structured was, is it better that, should roads, like which is better, the roads generating electricity or roads not generating electricity? That's an interesting question, right? Well, I'd rather my roads generate electricity. But it's the wrong question to ask. Anyway, the point is that I've never forgotten about this, if you can't tell, it's haunted me for years. And it is always a reminder for me about being careful what kind of questions you ask. Because if you ask the wrong question, you'll get a stupid answer, or you'll go down the wrong path. So don't be solar roadways, is the point. I actually know very little about it. Maybe it's some genius that I don't understand, but... It's not. Okay. <laughs> it's not. Um, uh, 
uh, Calvin says, if you run out of energy, do you just die of dehydration <laughs> in the middle of the outback? Um, <laughs> uh, no, no. Um, you just start going slower and slower. Um, like, for example, you know, there was one day, the first day of the 2017 race that we did, um, we went too fast. We like, we went too fast. We shouldn't have gone, we were doing like 72 on average and we should have been doing like 68. And when we got towards the end of the day, like about four o'clock, you finish at five for like sunset-ish, um, we had to like lower the speed down to like 40 or then like 30. So we were like going along the highway at 30 for an hour because we were just like out of energy. But um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, Hayden, how, do you, how, would, how would a first year be able to join a project like SunSwift? Um, there are lots of projects out there at UNSW. They change structures all the time because, you know, new, new, new deans come in and then new, I don't know. So I wouldn't know where to point people these days, but um, each one is generally different. <coughs> what I'd probably say is like, just spend your time at uni broadly trying to have fun and learn things. There are lots of like little societies out there and big societies, like um, CSE soccer is an example, do a ton of stuff. They do a ton of like, um, events or they'll do workshops or you can go and like help run workshops and you can go and teach yourself things so you can help teach others so uh, how would you apply for something specific like SunSwift I don't know these days you could probably just google it to be honest it's pretty easy like no I'm serious like most 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 of these little organizations like to have websites right because it, websites make us all feel good and for bigger organizations it's where they can convey information um, so you can kind of go chat to them what, what I'd probably say is that um, uh, for software students, uh, groups like SunSwift and Redback aren't heavy software groups, um, but that can also be fun, you know? So like, uh, I enjoyed my time in some of these groups, but that was because I really enjoyed doing something more physical and not software-y. It wasn't like where I actually gained a great deal of software knowledge. Um, but like for instance, uh, RoboCup, when I was part of RoboCup, uh, I learned so much about software in like a really fine grained detail. I, that was where I learned most things about Git. That's where I learned most things about working with Git. I had this really crazy team member who was like, he'd like graduated years ago, but he just loved RoboCup. So he just hang around. And he was like, well, he was like one, one commit per line of code. It's like, you know, you write a line of code, you're committing that line of code. And if I don't see like 50 commits per merge request, like I'm gonna come in and beat you silly. And we had another team member in RoboCup who was like uh, the opposite. He's like, what's commit, you know? <laughs> um, and they didn't get along. And 20, 2016 when we went to RoboCup was like the absolute, we did so terribly. Um, what had happened was in 2014, 2015, UNSW won the world championship twice, right? On top of the world. And then I got involved. Right? <laughs> and, um, and, and most of the 2014 team, they're actually like alumni, like these superstars at like Google and other companies. Like they were all graduates, not all of them, but most of them. And they were like, we miss RoboCup. They used to be part of the team. And they were like, let's just come in after work and like destroy everyone on the planet. <laughs> so they like came in and like just superstars and they like won in 2014. Then they kind of didn't put in as much time and they like barely won in 2015 and then people kind of left and then it was just me and a few other people. It was me, a guy called Kenneth, who's a sweetheart, and then the Git master and then the Git peasant, right? <laughs> and the four of us were in, I think it was Germany, and um, we, did, we like completely lost, like just absolutely atrociously. And at one point I remember the kind of Git master guy was just absolutely um, getting stressed you know, like he's like, we're not doing well. And then the Git peasant guy was doing, getting stressed too. So he was just pushing code to master, like just like ripping in Git commit alls. He was including all these config files and random things into master. And the robots were like, not literally, figuratively catching on fire. And then they weren't talking. Then they were yelling about Git. And then Kenneth, the other guy, he was getting so stressed about them getting stressed. He went into, you know, like full shutdown mode. You know when someone gets so stressed, they just like sit there like this, and you're like, Kenneth, we need to, we, we have a game coming up, we need to get ready, and he's just like, mm -hmm. yeah, anyway, so that was a bad time, but the point is that um, don't, don't be a git 
uh, dogmatic person and don't be, uh, don't be a git careless person either. Um, all right, at this point, we're probably just killing time. Um, so to recap, tonight, tonight's been a bit of a more relaxed night to say hi to all those who are here. Um, so normally this lecture would take about, I don't know, 50 minutes, dragged on another half an hour with the random stuff. Um, the recap again, conceptual models are a simple way to take something complicated, simplify it, or for you to help remind yourself the basic functionalities of a system. State machines are really interesting and we're gonna ask you to model your project as a state machine for iteration three. Um, that's why we talk about it. It doesn't actually take very long, it's not that complicated, it's more just like a little nugget of you trying to learn some things. Um, I think that's it for tonight, so we'll wrap up. I'm gonna stop the recording. Um,